Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this regularly scheduled meeting of the Public Health, Environment, Civil Rights, and Engagement Committee on June 10th, 2019. My name is Philippe Cunningham, and I am the proud chair of this committee. With me at the dais are Council Members Cano, Schrader, Con uh, Vice Chair Gordon, Council Member Johnson, and Council Vice President Jenkins. Please let the record reflect that we have a quorum and con can conduct the business of this committee. I want to make sure to give a special shout out to our committee clerk, Kelly Giesler, as well as our uh, stand in today for our city attorney or committee attorney with Susan Trammell. So on our consent agenda today, uh, colleagues, we have three items and we have four items for discussion. The First item is accepting a grant from the Minnesota Department of Health in the amount of 1 uh, 7, over $1.7 million for the evidence-based home visiting program. The second is approving uh, two, a, a council appointment of Laura Rangard for seat 11, Ward 11, and the council reappointment of Yolanda Adams Lee for C18 member at large. And the last item is accepting a grant in the amount of $10,000 for from the Minnesota Department of Health for contaminants, outreach, and education. So I will go ahead and move approval of those three items. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? All right, seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The ayes have it and those items carry. We have, as I mentioned, four items for discussion. We have a lively day today, so I'm excited about that. Um, covering the gamut of amazing work that's happening that comes to this committee. So first up, we have receiving and filing the findings uh, and recommendations of the 2019 Health Inspection Study. Today we have our budget manager, we, uh, Mr. Intermill here to share with us this study. Mr. Intermill, the floor is yours. Certainly, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, for the record, Micah Intermill, the uh, city's budget director. So uh, I'm here to give just a brief introduction to the topic and then we'll uh, have our consultants join us. But uh, as a reminder, funding for a study of the health inspections program was included in the 2019 budget uh, through my division. Uh, the goal was to help answer so what's become somewhat of a perennial question uh, about the quote unquote right level of staff for the uh, health inspections program. I'm excited to introduce to you uh, Kate Noble and Matt Rezac, who are the consultants we have hired to perform this analysis uh, and provide some recommendations for strengthening the efficiency of that health inspections program. Um, I also have to say that though the funding went through uh, my office, this couldn't have been done without strong partnership from the health department. Uh, Dan Huff and his team uh, in the uh, environmental health uh, team are just phenomenal to work with, uh, as was uh, CPED uh, and the small business team and Zotiel. Uh, we could not have done it without their help either. Um, so with that, I will just uh, invite Matt to come and uh, present the findings. If you could please say your name for the record, that'd be appreciated. Welcome. Hi, I'm Matt Rezac, uh, and thanks, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the council for having me here today. Um, my colleague and I, Kate Noble, uh, we're consultants who've been working with a team from the city for the past three months to explore how health regulation of businesses compares with other jurisdictions in Minnesota and nationally. I have a background in public policy and philanthropy, and Kate's background is in research and evaluation. And I want to start uh, by thanking uh, Zoe Thiel and Dan Huff and his team and Micah Intermill, who just put a ton of energy and time into making sure that this study was relevant and inclusive and thorough. So thanks to all of you. And they will also be here to help uh, me stand for questions if any were to arise. Uh, the study was really prompted by three interrelated concerns. Uh, one is the potential for overregulation uh, of Minneapolis businesses. Uh, second is the questions about the right size of the Minneapolis Environmental Health Department. And third is a gap between the expenses and revenues that are attribu attributable to MEH, also known as the recovery ratios. So with these as context, our task today is to uh, inform council's discernment about whether to increase, decrease, or maintain the level of health regulatory activity that occurs in Minneapolis. And I'll start with an overview of the methodology we used, uh, which is described in detail in the report. Let's see. 
Uh, in sum, we reviewed federal guidelines, state statutes, and local ordinances in Minneapolis and elsewhere to get a sense of what regulation is required of the city and then what regulation results from local discretion, whether that be uh, local discretion that's articulated in city ordinances or through department level discretionary practices. Uh, we then learned as much as we could about what regulation is actually happening through interactions with about 35 people, which included interviews, informational meetings, tagging along on health inspections. Um, we also summarized health inspection data from the Enterprise Database Elms and from data requests that we made of other jurisdictions. And in order to get a good sense of comparison, uh, nine jurisdictions were included in the study, both locally and nationally, and they were St. Cloud, St. Paul, Bloomington Richfield, Brooklyn Park, Hennepin County, Multnomah County, Portland, King County, Seattle, Denver, and Kansas City. It didn't take long before we recognized that we were studying an iceberg, and I would get a chance to use one of my favorite slides. <clears throat> uh, so the visible part of the iceberg represents observable things that people talk to us about uh, when we started the study. Things like the recovery ratios, the number of inspectors, complaints from vocal business owners, uh, the permitting practices, especially vents, uh, the uh, consequences of high stakes hosting of high profile events like the Super Bowl and the Final Four, and changes that the health department has made to adjust to feedback from state and municipal policymakers in recent years. <clears throat> and what we found is that all of these things uh, are surface level expressions of much deeper patterns and policies and values that shape regulatory activity in Minneapolis. And so as you know, I mean, lasting solutions to problems are ones that are found at those deeper levels of change below the surface. But I thought it was worth naming this because we all face so many pressures to find kind of quick fixes to things, uh, and our hope, Kate and Mai's hope, and the team's hope is that this study will begin to illuminate what those deeper system dynamics are so they can be better understood and addressed. So with that, I'll start with some of the key findings. Um, the biggest takeaway that we found is that Minneapolis health regulation is basically on par with everyone else who was in the study. Uh, some jurisdictions regulate significantly more and others regulate a little bit less. Uh, one way to gauge this is the frequency of routine inspections. So Minneapolis does the minimum frequency of routine inspections allowed by state statute, which is uh, every 12 months for high risk facilities, every 18 months for medium risk, and every 24 months for low risk facilities. Most jurisdictions in Minnesota follow this frequency also, but some, like uh, Bloomington Richfield, choose to inspect more often on a routine basis. National cities who are more comparable to Minneapolis in terms of size and demographics, such as Seattle, Denver, and Kansas City, all ex inspect more often. <clears throat> For instance, Kansas City inspects their high-risk facilities four times per year, which is four times as often as Minneapolis does. Uh, another way to gauge of Minneapolis being sort of on par is the frequency of reinspections. So reinspection frequency basically refers to how often a business is found far enough out of compliance during their routine inspection that they need to be inspected again sooner, sooner rather than later. Uh, routine inspections lead to reinspections in Minneapolis about 36% of the time, and the average among all the jurisdictions we studied is a little more often, about 39% of the time. <clears throat> Minneapolis is also somewhere in the middle in terms of how many inspections each inspector and each inspector conducts on average. <clears throat> so I apologize that the numbers do not end up on this graph, but uh, what those indicate is that the average of those, uh, the numbers of inspections per food pool and lodging inspector in 2018 was about 390, although the range is quite broad. So Kansas City had 753 inspections per inspector. St. Paul conducted about 162 inspections per inspector, and that's a combination of both the Minnesota Department of Health and the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, who regulate St. Paul on behalf of the state of Minnesota. Uh, and in there is Minneapolis with about 311 inspections per inspector, which is a, a bit less than the average of 390, but still more than most local jurisdictions, as you can see on the slide. Mr. Rizek, I have a question from Councilmember Gordon. Sure, Mr. Chair. Councilmember. <clears throat> yeah, I'm curious. Th this uh, number of inspections, the 311, that's with the current staffing that we've had this year and last year? Yes, this was 2018 numbers. Okay, and does that include uh, any inspections we might have done for big events? I'm trying to remember which big events we may have had in 2018. But yes, I'm pretty sure that these are just the routine reinspections that would have happened um, 
or inspections that would have happened as part of the, the regular course of business. Was that so was that a plan for year or was that this year? Maybe the Super Bowl was in 2018. But okay, that but that was just a routine inspection. Yes, I believe so. Although if I'm wrong about that, I will. Yes, I'm getting nods from thank you the team along the back of the wall who are closer to the information on a day-to-day -day basis than I am. Thanks. <clears throat> Uh, two other ways that we looked into how Minneapolis staffing levels, uh, levels compared to others were comparing sort of the, the total inspector FTEs to population and comparing total inspector FTEs to the number of sites that needed to be inspected. So first off, using population as a metric, uh, Minneapolis is again an about average where there's one inspector for every 23,000 residents in the city. Uh, the average amongst the jurisdictions that we studied was one for every 26,000 residents. Uh, and then unfortunately, we found that using um, the sites as a metric, like the number of sites that needed to be inspected, it was not a helpful comparison because there's just such a wide variety of ways that sites are counted across jurisdictions. And so we just couldn't get an apples to apples comparison in that respect. And you can read all, all about that in the report if your curious, curiosity leads you there. Um, so while there are, um, in all of these kind of primary sort of big picture ways, Minneapolis is really on average with other jurisdictions in terms of health regulation, we did find a few ways that Minneapolis is an outlier that we wanted to lift up and that I think are important to note. Uh, first, uh, one area is Minneapolis regulation is higher than anywhere else in terms of the number of violations that are called per inspection. So when an inspector finds something out of compliance during an inspection, they cite it as a violation and include it on the inspection report, and this is called, uh, this is known as calling a violation. Uh, so an inspector can call either a critical or a non-critical violation. And non-critical violations are ones that don't have like a direct urgent threat to food safety uh, or to injury. And critical violations are ones that do, basically. Uh, so Minneapolis called the most violations in 2018 compared to other jurisdictions in the study. And it also called the highest percentage of non-critical violations. We dug into this a little bit more, and you'll, you'll note on the chart there that MDA, Minnesota Department of Agriculture, is the highest, and Minnesota Department of Health is the third highest in terms of violations called per inspection. And we thought this might be important because uh, Minnesota Environmental Health has told us that they are required by their delegation agreement with these state departments to call non-critical violations. And so it could be that, you know, given that Minneapolis is really obviously a cornerstone, plays a cornerstone role in the state, that it receives additional oversight from these agencies that leads them to be more strict in calling violations. But that's, uh, you know, that's just speculation that would require another study to be able to say that with certainty. Um, another way Minneapolis is an outlier is in the amount of time it takes to complete an inspection report. So this really stood out to us. On average, it takes as long to input data as it does to complete an inspection, which is about 90 minutes for each. And there are others who do everything in about 90 minutes, who do everything in half the time. Uh, so while it's true that most of the jurisdictions in Minnesota name data entry inefficiency as an area of improvement, it's also true that all the major metro areas that we talk to nationally have a much more efficient system than Minneapolis does. Uh, and so again, we dug into this because this was surprising. And the problem clearly is not that, you know, there are slow typing or thumb twiddling inspectors. Uh, it's that there's a problematic mismatch between how the ELMS enterprise software is configured and the data requirements of tracking health regulation. Uh, and so this mismatch makes it harder to enter data, harder to track data, harder to extract useful data. And so basically it's just very hard to use data to drive learning and innovation for health inspections in Minneapolis because there's this incongruence between the system and the data that is needed. Um, the big picture point is there's this larger municipal structure that's affecting health regulatory practices, and that plays out in another way also uh, with business licensing. <clears throat> so uh, another of our key findings is that Minneapolis business licensing fee schedule is longer, more detailed, less integrated, and less user-friendly than many other jurisdictions. And one of our interviewees said this quote, I never compare our fees to Minneapolis because I can't read their fee schedule. I have to call their staff and ask. I have worked in this field for 50 years and I can't figure out the square footage of all. 
So there's a large section in the report that details this issue, but in sum, the number of licenses and license categories seems to make everyone's job harder, both businesses who are looking for licenses and city staff too. And like with data tracking, most jurisdictions have identified this as a problem, their licensing fee structure, but also as with data tracking, many are further along than Minneapolis is so far in addressing it. Um, some, an example of, of one of the um, faults of the current structure or the, the problems is that it does not align fees with costs. So, for instance, the fees for large hotels and restaurants that have alcohol are generally lower in Minneapolis than other jurisdictions, whereas the cost for food trucks and carts are higher. <clears throat> and a potential consequence for health regulation is uh, that the long and confusing fee schedule would appear to feed the perception that the health department is overly complicated and comes with many separate fees, all of which make it harder to do business. That would, that's, the, that's the risk that that would become the perception. Um, but in fact, we found that there are, there's at least one instance where uh, the health department seems to be going above and beyond to help businesses, uh, and that's with their short-term events. <clears throat> so a short-term event is a food and beverage service establishment which operates no more than 10 total days in conjunction with fairs, celebrations, community celebrations, Carnivals, circuses, promotional food product events, sports events, and other special events. All very fun things. Uh, Minneapolis inspects the second most short-term events of any jurisdiction with 703. Uh, although it's notable that the second or the highest number is Kansas City and they have twice that amount at over 1,400. Um, and this high rate of inspecting uh, short-term events may be an unintended consequence of using short-term event permits as like a, a pro-business workaround uh, to help uh, allow business activity in certain situations, such as if a, if a restaurant wants to grill outside on their back patio. Um, the report suggests a few things the city can do to minimize the need to use short-term events as a workaround and lighten the load on businesses, on uh, the city permitting process, and on the Minneapolis or, uh, Health um, Environmental Health Department as well. Uh, so a final way that current practices in Minneapolis is, are sort of an outlier is in the plan review process. I actually want to jump in here. We sure. have a follow-up question from Councilmember Gordon. And this is actually about the first reason we were an outlier, um, and I noticed also in the report, it was pretty striking when it came to some of those hotels. So you have, uh, you compared certain hotels with certain areas, and it, um, the, the Hilton, uh, the, I guess what it looks like um, with its 821 rooms, um, they're only paying $8,227, but if they were located in Bloomington, they would be paying 20, over $20,000. Did you find any, from, from the looks of it here, we are the um, least expensive um, in hotels. So I'm curious if there's anyone that would, did you find anyone that charges less than we do? For that was hired time? not in the study that we found. I'm again looking over to make sure that I'm not missing some important detail, but okay. uh, yeah, what's in there is, is what we found. I will say that all of the information is not available from all the jurisdictions that we studied, so it's sure. not to say that there aren't some out there, but of the ones we were able to get information for, we tried to uh, put the key info in there. Well, I just thought that was worth highlighting a little mm -hmm. bit, so thank you. Thank you. I have a question from, or comment from Councilmember Schrader. Hi, can you go back one slide? Sure. Just had a question about Kansas City, because you, you mentioned that Minneapolis, it looks like we use short-term events as a workaround. Does Kansas City, looking at their numbers, it looks like, do they do the same thing? Uh, we didn't have a chance to do a follow-up interview with Kansas City after we got that information from them. Um, so that's, that would be the logical next follow-up question, but I can't say for sure. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And I have a question. So um, piggybacking off of that around the workaround, can you explain a little bit more what that, you had talked about grilling outside, for example, but can you elaborate a little bit more concretely about what that means and what the recommend, we might get to the recommendations on that later, but yes. um, if you could talk more concretely about what that workaround looks like and the frequency of it. Sure, so most generally, um, and again, I always will call upon my phone of friends uh, to help me out if I get this wrong, but, um, without uh, creating a new, uh, basically indoor facility outside, uh, say off of a deck, a restaurant can't, can't just grill out, outdoors unless it's connected to a special event permit. And so let's say you had a restaurant that, you know, wants to do 
grilling out every third Thursday of the summer or something like that, or every Thursday, they would need to request a special event permit for every single one of those events in order to be allowed to do that business activity. And that that's, that's the sort of thing that um, my understanding is the, the health department has worked with businesses to try to find those kinds of solutions so that they can do that kind of work. Um, but it's uh, you know, maybe not the most elegant sort of policy solution. Great, thank you for that clarification. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I don't want to rob you of the chance to hear about plan reviews. So uh, MEH, uh, Minnesota Environmental Health, is required to be involved in a plan review process uh, whenever a restaurant, for example, is built or remodeled. And so this plan review process requires several city departments to review plans and also includes the state uh, departments in doing electrical plan review. And so uh, the plan review process is often considered burdensome to business owners because it involves navigating the requirements of several city and state departments who do not always coordinate or communicate accurately about one another's requirements. Uh, and so this frustration is amplified because an unapproved plan uh, can ultimately halt business activity, that they can't, they can't open up until they get that final plan review, uh, plan review uh, approved. Um, and so in the report, we name a few things that we think the city maybe can do overall to stream, streamline the plan review process that, again, would simplify things for everyone, the business owners and city staff alike. So before covering at a really high level just a few recommendations of the report, and because it is my favorite slide of all time, I want to briefly revisit the iceberg. <clears throat> so I hope what I've shared so far is it's illustrating the fact that there's a lot that's going on beneath the service, surface that drives health regulation in Minneapolis. So there's state statutes, there's the, the ELMS data platform uh, relationship, zo different zoning restrictions that would relate to this grilling example, uh, and cross-department processes like plan review. And so um, you know, any decision about uh, Minnesota environmental health without, without seeing its actions in the context of these larger system forces just won't lead to lasting solutions. And that's what that little loop at the top of the slide is meant to suggest, that like, if you go too quickly to a solution without going down below, it just sort of ricochets back and creates a new type of a problem. So the, the main takeaways, again, that we found are most of what uh, the health department does is very standard and comparable to other jurisdictions. And most of the things that the health department does uh, that are outliers are due to factors that are beyond their direct control, but result from being part of a larger sort of municipal ecosystem. Um, so now I'll turn to the recommendations. And I'll, I'll note that in the report and also here, um, they're listed in, in order of sort of short-term tactical changes, like you'd see in the iceberg, uh, intermediate strategic changes, and then more longer-term systemic changes. And so theoretically, the timeline for full implementation and uh, the related results would correlate with those, those time horizons. <clears throat> And this is just a sampling of the recommendations that are in the report and isn't meant to replace your reading of the full slate of recommendations, which I hope that you will do if you haven't already. Uh, so one, obviously, uh, maintain most of the environmental uh, health department's practices. Um, two, improve the licensing and fee structure. And our understanding is that there have been efforts to do that or to, to analyze that in recent years. And um, I guess I would, uh, we would just hold up that there are other places that have stuck with it. It sounds like an arduous, mm, not fun task. Uh, but I think Denver has moved their fee structure from you know, somewhere in the 40s down to a dozen. And they're just about to launch. And they're very excited about this new uh, streamlined system that they'll have in place. Uh, figuring out how to address the incongruency between uh, how ELMS is configured and the health regulation data. I understand there's a, there's a ELMS committee that perhaps could work with the health department to figure out if there's some sort of a, an interface that could communicate between what the inspectors need to do on site and what uh, the, the ELM system does in the back office so that those two things can work better together. That's what we've seen in other jurisdictions do. Um, and, and then this changing how short-term inspections and, and plan review happen. Um, to the question of whether to increase, decrease, or maintain the level of health regulatory activity that occurs in Minneapolis, I'll try to just name that directly. Uh, it seems to us that if it were to decrease now, uh, what would end up happening is that an, what's all, an already stretched inspection crew would start to feel overwhelmed 
uh, and trying to accomplish what is basically a standard body of work as compared to other jurisdictions. Uh, but if the process improvements like these, or whether they're these or some others, uh, are made and they, they do in fact increase efficiency, in time that would give uh, the city more options. Uh, and so one option would be to reduce staffing, one would be to increase outreach to immigrant business owners and to continue accelerating Minneapolis as a, as a cultural and economic hub in that respect. Um, another option would be to do more regulatory activity and be more like uh, how Kansas City and Seattle and Denver operate. Uh, and then yet another is to just position yourself for the unknown <laughs> of the future. Um, that you know there, there may be a time when there are new regulatory demands such as if uh, Minnesota becomes part of the cannabis economy and that that creates new regulatory practices. Um, so I guess our, our point is that maintaining what is happening now seems uh, like it, there's a lot of really reasonable justifications for doing that. And if you're able to make these back, um, these sort of back office efficiencies, it would give you more options in the future. So I want to, uh, before standing for questions, just really quickly go through uh, or just display the list of all the people who uh, helped us out with this. It was a tremendous amount of people who were very generous with their time. Uh, the small business team conducted the interviews of the businesses and we really appreciated that assistance. Lots of city staff, uh, health inspectors, uh, inspectors who let us tag along while they're doing their work, and then tons of interviewees from other jurisdictions across uh, the metro area and across the country. So with that, I'm happy to stand for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for your hard work on this uh, quite thorough, um, quite expansive in terms of, of who was involved, um, who was interviewed, the various jurisdictions. Um, I had a question, actually, about the staffing, just because we mentioned staffing a few mm -hmm. times. Is that including the two inspectors that are currently funded through one-time dollars, or is that excluding those? Nope, that includes their uh, their role that they played in 2008. Great, so mm -hmm. that includes the two. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Councilmember Gordon. I don't think I have any other questions right now. I, I just really appreciate the report and all this information. I, um, I'm still kind of going through and considering it. Though, um, I think it's important that we follow up on some of these things. I mean, identifying a problem with plan plan review process is pretty significant. That's an interdepartmental, uh, complicated um, thing that we have. And if we could streamline and make it more effective, uh, that that could be fantastic. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm, I guess I'm a little worried where you might leave some things on the table here, receive and file the report, and move on. Um, I don't necessarily have a staff direction, but I might have a question about when we might hear back. Um, but besides plan review, um, we also had the issue of our whole fee structure and streamlining that administrative process. And of course, that includes lots of other licenses that aren't just in the health. So that's an, um, something hopefully that we, I believe this is actually coming to um, Reg Services Committee, something we can look at there and maybe there's even an opportunity to give some kind of staff direction or um, at least an understanding of when we might get some information back. Um, I, I, it, it really pained me to have you open up the uh, Elms debate um, because this has been such a problem for us and we've heard lots of complaints about it and always thinking a little more practice, finish the final rollout, oh, just some minor modifications, it's all going to go really well. So, and then you had a lot of confidence and this looked pretty easy to do uh, and overlay a system over there, but I think um, I mean, it would be great if we could find a way to bring that 90 minutes of, of wrestling with the software down to something more manageable. Mm -hmm. um, but we can't decide that here. That's another thing that's going to take a lot more analysis and some mm -hmm. review there. And there's probably other things that um, I didn't even remember, but those are some things that kind of stand out is, well, if, if, to take advantage of this and these recommendations, we're really going to have to um, look at them and do some work. And you didn't go through all the recommendations. And I have a, I, I'm, uh, I suspect that staff's already willing and interested in the department of following up on some of them, maybe mm -hmm. de-emphasizing those non-critical um, violations, which I understand we have to report in any way. We have to have those violations, but obviously um, that that's not the thing that we're going to spend the most time trying to fix. It's those critical ones. Mm -hmm. um, so. 
I guess um, I'm open to the idea that the committee could um, touch this, but also I guess I'll just raise the expectation um, that we should have an opportunity to hear back from our own staff about what they think about the recommendations and how much they think they can take action and when on those, if not today, um, sometime in the future. Thank you, Councilmember Gordon. Did you, were you interested in setting a, a date perhaps for a report back on this or is that something you would like to discuss at some other point? Well, um, I wouldn't like to set a date without consulting with the sounds department good. staff first. Yeah, yeah sounds so, good. So, well, because well, I know you're interested in a staff direction, so I wanted to check in yeah, and see if no, that was something you were interested nothing's in. Nothing's ready right now, but um, maybe we'll think about it. And possibly with some consultation, there can be a small amendment even at the council meeting. Um, That's and, great. And we'll see how the discussion goes tomorrow, too, with some of the same information at another committee. Great. Thank you, council Thank member. You. Um, I just want to bring attention to, um, to my colleagues' attention that in the RCA there is um, a high-level high summary of the findings and the recommendations, as well as an executive summary for those who maybe are time crunched and are not as big of a nerd as me and want <laughs> to read the whole thing. So if you want to get a quick glance at it, that's a way for you to be able to do so. Seeing no further comments or questions, thank you again. Thank you, team. Uh, really wonderful uh, product that came out of out of this investment. So thank you so much. You, and with that, I move approval of receiving and filing the findings and recommendations of the 2019 health inspection studies. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The ayes have it and that item carries. Next up, we have a presentation on regenerative agriculture and biochar use. Uh, so we have a resolution recognizing regenerative agriculture and biochar use as an impactful climate action and resilience tool that delivers benefits to Minneapolis residents and our environment. So we have a great team of folks who are gonna be speaking to this item today. So I will turn it over to Claire. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and council members. We're happy to be here today uh, to talk about the regenerative agriculture and biochar resolution sponsored by council member Schrader, who is also a city council member representative of the homegrown Minneapolis Food Council, which supports this resolution. Um, my name is Claire Begley and I'm the Urban Agriculture Program Specialist with Homegrown Minneapolis, which is an initiative uh, dedicated to expanding our abilities to our community's ability to grow, process, distribute, eat, and compost more healthy, sustainable, locally grown foods. I'm also here today with Jim Doughton, um, Supervisor of Environmental Services for the Minneapolis Health Department, who will be talking about biochar later on in this presentation. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so to start, regenerative agriculture is something that I'll walk through a definition of, um, talk about what it actually means to do regenerative agriculture, why this matters to Minneapolis. Jim will touch specifically on biochar, which is a uh, specific practice um, that you can use as a part of regenerative agriculture. Um, and then we'll talk about why this resolution matters for Minneapolis. So to start, regenerative ag, uh, I'm gonna shorten it a little bit, it's long. Regenerative ag represents a paradigm shift in how we think about managing and caring for land. Um, and it also recognizes the ecological and social benefits of practices that are already occurring and should continue to be promoted. So to begin with a definition, regenerative agriculture is a holistic land management practice that enhances and sustains the health of the soil by restoring its carbon content, which in turn improves productivity. Um, part of that definition comes from drawdown. So uh, that is a great definition to start with, but I also thought it was important to include uh, a part of um, what the Rodale Institute does. The Rodale, Robert Rodale actually coined the term regenerative agriculture years before this definition existed. But the Rodale Institute offers something called a regenerative organic certification, which factors in not only soil health, but also animal welfare and social fairness. And these two additional factors are really critical to this conversation because we don't have agriculture and land management systems without connection to animals and humans. Um, this really helps us think beyond just soil health and why that's important, but also the potential benefit of regenerative ag practices within overburdened communities facing disproportionate negative impacts from climate change. 
So what does regenerative agriculture actually look like in practice and how can we scale it to Minneapolis when it's commonly used to describe larger scale agricultural systems? Um, last time I checked, we're a city, not a rural area. So this is a tricky conversation. Um, but I will just mention too, as I said before, biochar should be included on this list, but Jim is going to expand on it. So that will come later in the presentation. Um, really, first, most importantly, this picture on the right here is an image of what healthy soil looks like. To give a really brief summary of why that's healthy, it's dark in color, meaning it's rich in organic matter, meaning it's storing carbon, because carbon is stored as organic matter in the soil. There's these white threads called fungal hyphae, uh, which actually help to hold the soil together, deliver more nutrients to plants, and sh are um, a really good sign of health of the microbial community in the soil. And then you can see all these little pieces of organic matter and stuff that's just in there, like straw. Um, that's what healthy soil looks like. It doesn't just have one color, it's not just one texture. It's really an ecosystem, and that's what we're trying to support with regenerative ag practices. Just stay there. <laughs> Thanks. Nope. Um, so how do we get soils that actually look like this? A really quick overview of practices include not tilling. So the more we disturb the soil, the more we break up that web of life and structure that already exists in our soil. We can use mulches and cover crops that reduce erosion, hold the soil in place, and help keep water in our soils. That's especially important as we face increased uh, downpour, downpour events from climate change and increased um, amounts of high heat and drought periods where we need to maintain that in order to retain productivity in our soils. We can also plant biodiverse native plants, perennial plants um, in our landscapes and gardens. This image down on the bottom left shows the root systems of prairie plants in the Midwest. Um, while not all applicable to the urban area, we can see that below and above ground there's so much going on that's supporting pollinators, supporting the soil microbes that live in the soil. This is one of the ways we can sequester more carbon by having living roots in the soil more often. Um, and then these plants, being a diverse array of plants, are supporting pollinators, people, um, and animals that rely on them for food, fuel, and fiber. And then finally, just to, <laughs> to finish up on that slide, um, another regenerative egg practice relying on in-farm fertility. So that would mean uh, composting on site, using sources of fertility that come from the place where you're doing the, the farming or the land care. Um, it could also mean integrating chickens into your farm or garden system because we know that chicken manure is fertilizer and that's good for the soil. Um, and then finally, uh, in, in congruence with the Minneapolis Pollinator Friendly City Resolution, we know that pesticides are harmful to pollinators. That's something that our city has taken a stance on already. Um, in addition to not using pesticides, um, regenerative egg also calls for not using synthetic fertilizers because that is harmful to the soil biology and this, the ecosystem that we're trying to support. So these practices can be taken um, and applied in context of our communities. This image here is of um, Angelina and Jasmine at one of the gardens on the Minneapolis Garden Lease Program sites. So these practices specifically could benefit communities that are um, facing disproportionate impacts from climate change by helping to restore urban soils that are suffering from really poor soil health. Um, it could also help to support production of nutrition, nutritious locally grown foods. As of last count, we have just about 300 community gardens, market gardens, and urban farms in our city and are working on getting an updated number. Um, these practices can also provide economic opportunities related to farming, landscaping, um, or compost and biochar production. And with mention of biochar, I will let Jim share more. Thank you, Claire. Chair, council members. Uh, biochar, um, what is it? And I'll try to keep it simple because uh, if people know me, I tend to chat a lot. This is about a 2,000 year old practice that we happen to refine, uh, refine again and uh, bring back into vogue and with a little twist. It's a soil enhancer that can hold carbon, boost food security, and increase soil biodiversity. And it's a process, and it's really charcoal 
that helps retain nutrients and water. And that, that definition comes from the International Biochar Initiative. And the, the neat thing about it, and I've got some biochar here, is that uh, the carbon in biochar resists degradation and can be held in the soil for hundreds, if not thousands, of years. And uh, she had mentioned, a, Claire had mentioned a key word there before, was drawdown and the ability to um, reverse climate change is not only stop it, but go carbon negative and reverse the process. Biochar is one of those things that's recognized by the National Panel, Panel on Climate Change as one of the six carbon negative technologies that can actually accomplish that. Some of the benefits of biochar, and as I said, what it is, it's, it's uh, um, basically it's, it's charcoal. And uh, you make it by taking waste biomass and heating it up in the absence of oxygen, you get charcoal. It's a fancy type of charcoal. You can't just take the Kingsford briquettes and throw it in your garden. It just doesn't work. But if you do it right, at the right temperature, at the right feedstock for the right time, you end up with something that can last for thousands of years. But it has a lot of amazing benefits beyond just locking up that carbon for a long period of time. It actually brings life back to the soil and enhances the microbial activity that Claire had mentioned mycorrhizal fungi and stimulates additional carbon in the soil beyond just what you put in the ground. So it continues to build carbon and draw carbon down in, and put it back into the ground and help us adapt to re and reverse climate change. But some of the things it also does is help in the city infrastructure, stormwater retention. It has the amazing ability to hold water, take the water in rather than pouring it down into the storm drain, retains it where it's used for the plants and put back up and helps build additional carbon in the form of those plant roots and associated uh, microbial activity in the soil. We have increased carbon sequestration. They said this is up to 2,000 years, this stuff will still be here. Um, but it also, it's, it's, it's not an inert material. It interacts with the soil and, and drives a lot of processes. Uh, one of the, the results is, is increases crop yield. You'll see that. I couldn't find a better model to hold the corn, but that's what I had. Uh, but you look to the one to the right, or my right, I should say my right, left on the picture, I guess. Uh, that cob right there is from Little Earth and was grown in the soil with biochar. Uh, the other one was compost and the other was compost and biochar. And that cob there is are pretty much the average from the one side and what we saw on the, the other side. You can see the difference in yield. And compost is a great thing, but the synergies that you see with the biochar by adding that and stimulating the activity, you can see why. It's an important practice, regenerative practice. And the other thing is uh, we can do increase the soil health, like we mentioned, with the increased microbial and, and fungal activity. And as, like I said, it's, it's identified as a carbon negative um, technology by the National Panel on Climate Change. Just want to mention that uh, Council Member Schrader, um, Public Works Director Robin Hutchison and myself recently returned from Stockholm where we went on a trip sponsored by Bloomberg Philanthropies and hosted by the city of Stockholm. Stockholm has gone full bore into the biochar. They see it as part of the circular economy, taking their garden waste, putting it through. You can see the picture on the, I guess my left, is uh, the machine that they got. They actually take their waste, turn it into biochar, which some of which is redistributed for urban agriculture to home users, but a lot of it is put it into the city infrastructure to help out with urban forestry, stormwater management, et cetera really helps clean up. They're, they're using everything they produce, and they're currently looking at building a second, another plant, which is going to increase uh, by fivefold their biochar production, and they still won't have the ability to absorb all the use, all that they'll produce. They need more. Uh, one of the things on that is also part of their climate action plan, and uh, they see significant results in the ability to reduce carbon and actually achieve, they, they don't feel they can achieve carbon neutrality without some component of being negative, carbon negative in there, and that's an important part to make it uh, into that part. And the waste heat that's in there also goes to feed their f the central heat heating district, a lot like our HERC uh, helps heat downtown. They tap into the, their central heating district and it helps heat a lot of houses. Um, they're going to be increasing that component quite a bit, and they see that as a strong component of their cycle, why they do that. And Claire, you want to come back up? Okay, we're just going to talk about quick about why does this matter for us? Actually, I want to jump in with a question. So yes, uh, where do they grab, uh, where do they take the, um, 
the material. So in, instead of gathering compost, is it that they gather that and then use that instead? How do they um, install it? Yeah, and it's kind of a definition what you and I think of as garden waste and what they feel as garden waste is a little bit different, at least in my mind. When I think of garden waste, I think a lot of the soft uh, materials, the rotten tomatoes, the leaves, etc. They do take that and collect that and they do make compost. And one of the things I should say, we have an agreement right now with Metawakan and Sioux, uh, Shakopee, Metawak and Sioux community, we, and we work with them mixing our compost, their biochar, and provide that for urban gardeners in areas that are said where we see health disparities in underserved communities, and it's been great. A lot of the work has been with the American Indian community in the city, uh, which is why we see a lot of the work in the Phillips neighborhood. Uh, but they take that component that still uses compost, they, uh, and they do use that in their city infrastructure along with biochar as well and primarily in with their, their, at this time, with their urban forestry. But what they're talking about in the gar their garden waste is actually, we call their woody waste, the tree limbs, the bushes, et cetera. And the soft, squishy stuff, the leaves, et cetera, actually cause a problem with them with high moisture and low carbon content. But they're really trying to get take that woody mass and make their biochar out of that. And it's just they're, how they define garden versus us. I'd call it more of a, a tree waste or you know, their woody waste. Got it. Uh, Councilmember Schrader. It's not on that point, Mr. Chair. The one thing Jim said before is like garbage in, garbage out. So the better thing you can put in, uh, the better quality. If it's a tree waste, the better bio, the, the better the benefits of the biochar are going to be. So while you can do it for a lot of things, uh, the better quality you can put in, the more you're going to get out of it. Yeah, the, the carbon that you get out of the woody, that the soft tomatoes and leaves, it's, it, it doesn't hang around as long as the woody waste just doesn't have the components and the, what you end up with is uh, different. And what we're looking at as a city, I should mention, is uh, right now is we're working with, trying to work with an engineering firm, uh, an African-American engineering firm to try to produce this locally, is take what we waste and bring it back into the community. Wonderful, thank you. Claire. All right. Okay. Thanks. So just to uh, wrap up why this resolution matters for Minneapolis to bring it back to our context here in the city. Um, so as a city, this resolution could help us meet goals outlined in the Climate Action Plan, which doesn't yet include mention of agriculture. Um, we are also developing a Minneapolis Food Action Plan to identify specific goals and benchmarks to address climate change and a healthier local food system and economy. Um, this also would be a way to encourage residents to support a healthy local and just food economy by purchasing directly from farms that use regenerative agriculture practices. Um, we have a myriad of farmers markets, co-ops, CSA programs in our city and that could be a really great opportunity to be able to promote this. Um, this resolution would also empower residents, organizations and businesses to lower their own carbon footprint by implementing regenerative ag practices in their own backyards, in community gardens that they take part in, or within market gardens or urban farms. Um, and then finally, promoting regenerative agriculture practices on city-owned lots leased to gardeners through the Garden Lease Program. This map is a, a map of all the current lots leased and available to folks in the city of Minneapolis to lease as a community or market garden. Um, this is just a snapshot of the nearly 300 that I mentioned before. So there's a large opportunity on city-owned lots, but also in other areas within the city. Um, and then this could expand to being beneficial on public land owned by the city, uh, such as on boulevards. And I know Jim had maybe a little bit more to speak to on that. Yes, real quick. And the, one of the things we're looking at, I know you hear the word agriculture a lot, but they want you to think of the uh, regenerative practices in how it relates to climate change and what the city can do to address it. We have a lot of public infrastructure right now that can be adapted into carbon sinks and actually uh, uh, reduce our maintenance costs, reduce the effects of uh, climate change, deal with mitigation of climate change and changing climate patterns, and uh, by incorporating these practices to include biochar. Uh, some of the things recently, we just finished up a project last week with Hennepin County and doing a joint urban forestry project along uh, Hiawatha, replanting some trees to address the mortality and growth rate of the replacement trees that we've had in harsh environments. We have the effect of urban, or the uh, emerald ash borer, which is coming through, where we're losing a lot of big sticks and turning them into uh, 
what do we do to replace the environmental benefits uh, that the trees provide for health benefits as well as the carbon benefits. And so if we can make the trees grow faster, and that's what Stockholm really did a good job at show, illustrating to us was that they can take uh, and turn around in, in urban forest and turn it into a very solid source of uh, carbon storage. And we can see that again in stormwater management with uh, uh, urban infrastructure with the boulevard reconstruction, stormwater management, et cetera. And we've been in, in talks with Public Works and their new green infrastructure coordinator to try to develop up these practices and just make them the norm so that we can uh, become climate smart in how we address our infrastructure and adapt to the future. Um, with that, we are happy to answer any questions and thank you for your time. Thank you so much. I wanted to just take a moment to clarify um, with authorship of this resolution that I'm listed as the primary, I think it's because I'm the chair of the committee, but I want to make sure that all of the credit goes to Councilmember Schrader, <laughs> uh, who has been an amazing champion of this work. Um, I am really excited about biochar. I think that we have a really big opportunity with the, with the emerald ash and um, being able to uh, really use that in a productive way. We have a harmful thing that's happening, but we're able to take that and do something really productive with it. Uh, so thank you, Council Member Schrader, for your leadership on this so much. Council Member Johnson. Thank you for the presentation. I'm really excited about this and appreciate the leadership of Council Member Schrader as well. I just think it's uh, an incredible area and really uh, appreciate highlighting this indigenous technology that uh, has been developed long ago and that uh, we seem to have largely forgotten about or lost um, and I think it's really important and uh, I'm glad that we are working on this area. I also want to bring to my uh, colleagues attention that the um, Resolution is in is included with the RCA if folks are uh, interested in taking a look at it. Did you want to add something? I uh, just again want to thank Councilmember Schrader and Chair, Chairman uh, for your help on this getting this forward. And without your support, this wouldn't have this wouldn't have made it forward. And it's an important topic, so we very much appreciate it. Councilmember Schrader. Well, thank thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for that. But honestly, we're just trying to keep up with all the great work you're doing. Like, I, I first want to thank you know Jim and Claire for all the work you've been doing on this. Jim, this has been a side passion project that you have had so much excitement for. That's contagious, and I, I am so excited and proud to be working on this right now. And I'm excited about what we can do. Uh, I do have about three three points. You know, first, I think uh, to Claire's point about this being a paradigm shift. Like, I think that's that's almost an understatement. Like, for so long we have talked about how we have soil health and how we take care of um, you know, agriculture in our city and to think about you know how we have to stop using pesticides and what that means and to start thinking about like what, making sure that we're using organic fertilizer and all of that is is so counter to the way we've lived for so long um, is going to take some work um, so I think that this is a really great first step um, second you know I think one thing that wasn't said that's a little implied, and one of the things I'm actually most excited about, you know, we're so overwhelmed with facing climate change that we don't always think that this is an opportunity, that this, we can choose our future right now. Uh, we have to go quick and we got to be serious about it, but we can still think about a world that's that's better than we have right now, that's more equitable, that is, has more opportunities for people. And biochar for me is, is a great example of that. Um, while we have so many um, possibilities for a future that um, is sustainable, more resilient. Everyone can afford dirt <laughs> that may not be able to afford solar or a different uh, electric vehicles. Um, and then, you know, finally, uh, to the point that we're a city and not an agriculture, I, I think that that's an important point, uh, mainly for the, the distinction that we have this climate crisis that we're facing that we're not treating as a crisis. Um, in a crisis, you are thinking about every single resource you have, every single thing that goes out the door, every single square inch of soil um, is a resource that we have that we need to be thinking about. You know, in my area, um, we have an issue with stormwater reduction, so biochar would be a very convenient, sustainable, resilient answer. Um, and we need to be thinking about, as a city, what we do with every square inch um, here. So I mean, first and foremost, again, want to just thank staff. Um, I'm really excited uh, about moving this forward. Would now be a good time for the staff direction? 
Yes, go ahead. All right. Uh, also on that note, I'd like to offer a uh, motion to direct uh, sustainability, the Health Department and Public Works staff to explore ways to partner together to support and implement regenerative agriculture and biochar practices in the, in the future City Minneapolis projects and to report back to the Public Health Environment Civil Rights and Engagement Committee by August uh, 2019. And I should have said for my colleagues beforehand, we'll be passing out a sheet of what I just read. Great, thank you so much, Councilmember Schrader. Um, I also just wanted to say, uh, for the record, before we move on, that um, I wanted to make sure, so we do by default add the chair as, as one of the authors, but I wanted to be intentional about taking my name off of it so that you got the, your due props because you deserve it. You've been leading a lot on this. Um, so I just wanted to name that. Um, but also thank you um, for this motion here. Um, and thank you for the presentation. Um, are there any questions? Oh, yes, please. Well, well, I thank you very much for, you know, due props and all. If you stay on it, we'll just put you to work. So. <laughs> Challenge accepted. All right, uh, so we have a motion before us with a staff direction. Are there any questions or comments on it? All right, seeing none, those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 aye, those opposed say nay. The ayes have it and that motion is carried. Thank you again, Council Member Schrader, for your leadership on this issue. I would also like to uh, make a motion approving the passage of, a of the resolution rec recognizing regenerative agriculture and biochar use as impact, uh, impactful climate action and resilience tools that benefit deliver benefits to Minneapolis residents and our environment. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The ayes have it and that item carries. Thank you so much everyone. Now being able to really demonstrate how versatile and diverse the work is at the health department, we're going to be shifting now uh, to violence prevention. So we have uh, before us today is going to be a presentation on establishing the Office of Violence Prevention. I see we have a whole slew of folks here, but we'll have Commissioner Musicant kick us off. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Richard Musicant, Commissioner of Health. I'm just going to breeze through a couple slides at the beginning to get us started. Um, what we hope to discuss today is um, just giving you the briefest of backgrounds of sort of how we got to where we are today. Um, then the creation of the new Office of Violence Prevention and, and how that is proceeding. Uh, we will then hear about uh, work that's being done to get the um, steering committee off the ground and going very soon. And um, then the recommendations about spending the violence prevention fund. And finally, we'll hear from Cities United about some of their um, consultant reports for us. So um, briefly, we um, started this work in 2006, really, when Minneapolis was called um, Mini Murderapolis or something like that. Um, I, I should have remembered exactly what we were called. but. Um, it wasn't a good characterization, we didn't like it, and we also were concerned about what was happening in our community, not just our reputation. And so um, put a group together at the community level, began to think about how to proceed, and in 2008 came to the city council. The city council declared youth violence as something that is a public health issue, and we created a blueprint for action, and that was adopted as well. In 2013, we revisited that blueprint, updated it, and we also became a member of the National Forum on Youth Violence Prevention. So we're part of national efforts as, as well as uh, working locally. And then in 2016, we were able to add to that portfolio um, a CDC grant that focuses not only on um, in the way that we are focusing, but brings in um, teen dating violence as an additional component of violence prevention. 2016 and 17, we really expanded into um, tertiary prevention or um, more intervention, closer to intervention with the creation of the Next Step program, hospital-based, um, with our group violence intervention program, which we call Project Life. And then in 2018, uh, the City Council created a new committee replacing the previous one that was Youth Violence Prevention with a violence prevention steering committee, so really broadening the, the notion. And um, we had already seen with 
um, our GBI program an expansion beyond the very uh, smaller focus area of youth and young adults and so we're, we're already branching out and so 2018 really began to memorialize that and then by the end of the year um, there was an adoption of a budget that created the Office of Violence Prevention and so we have been on the journey to do the implementation of that. And uh, in the budget uh, decision that the council made, uh, the Office of Violence Prevention was placed in the health department. We uh, determined that it should be a standalone division within the department, reporting to the commissioner, worked with, that would be myself, um, worked with human resources to determine the proper classification of the leadership, um, and so have classified that as a director. And uh, we recruited for that position locally and nationally and had a multi-round set of interviews. We had representatives from the community, from the police department, from the city council and the mayor's offices. And are just waiting for some paperwork to do the announcement, but we'll not be announcing it today. But <laughs> we will have an announcement in the near future and are excited to move forward um, in formalizing um, that. So now I am going to turn it over to um, Sasha Cotton, who is our Youth Violence Prevention Coordinator, and she is going to talk about how we're doing with the steering committee and the grants that um, we have uh, for you to consider. Welcome, Ms. Cotton. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair and committee members. I appreciate the opportunity to be before you and talk a little bit about the work that we're doing in the Office of Violence Prevention. I am Sasha Cotton, as Ms. Musicant stated, Commissioner Musicant stated, our Youth Violence Prevention Coordinator in the Health Department. And I have the pleasure of talking a little bit about next steps. So right now, giving a little history, historically we have had a Youth Violence Prevention Executive Committee that is converting to an Office of Violence Prevention Steering Committee. It's just an opportunity to expand the scope and the people that we'll have around the table so we can think more broadly about the way violence is cutting across our community, not only just with young people, but really thinking about teen dating violence, intimate partner violence, domestic violence, and early childhood exposure to violence. So it gives our, um, both the office and the steering committee a greater reach. Um, in July of 2018, a resolution was passed for the development of that um, steering committee. I'm not gonna read this very dense slide to you verbatim, but <laughs> essentially, um, per your request and approval, it is a 21 member um, steering committee that consists of community members and other stakeholders across this enterprise and other systems that are all working in some way on issues related to violence prevention. Um, we'll also have, which I think makes us slightly unique, up to 10 non-voting members who are doing work here in the enterprise at the city of Minneapolis that we think touch points, have touch points on violence prevention. We wanna make sure that we have the best ex expertise within the city at the table on a regular basis. And so we're looking at um, the city attorney's office, and the police department and other folks to have stakeholders at that table, but not in a voting fashion. Um, these are the folks who have, at this point, been approved fully to be on the steering committee. So I will, um, I could read them, but we have quite a slew. Um, the chief of police will be one of our members, as well as Kimberly Cabrini from the Minneapolis School Board. She wants us to be very clear that she is not in an official capacity representing as the Minneapolis School Board, but she is representing all of the students in Minneapolis and the needs of young people. Um, Tyrese Cox, who is a superintendent of recreation with Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board, and has been a great advocate in our work already with pop-up parks. Lynn Crockett, who is our Ward 5 representative, um, and has also been a champion and an advocate in that community. Ayolanda Evans, who works with Protect Minnesota, which is um, the leading gun lobby agency in the state of Minnesota, and has been a key partner of our work up until this point. Dr. Rachel Hardiman, who works in the School of Public Health as an associate professor at the University of Minnesota and is doing some cutting edge research around police violence and its impact on communities of color. Reverend David Hottinger, who currently is um, the Director of Spiritual Healing and Healthcare at HCMC and is doing some work with us around Next Step. 
This is a long list. <laughs> Hennepin County Sheriffs, which we're really excited about with a new sheriff. We really want to make sure we have the first opportunity to have them at the table and really deeply involved with our violence prevention work at the city level. Lance Lamont, who was the Ward 9 appointee and is doing some really um, innovative work in the Native American community and around the Little Earth community around violence prevention. Um, Rosalind, I'm always going to mess up her name, uh, Pedersen who works with HUD but is really um, on our committee focused on um, re-offender uh, employment and re-entry. She is the board chair for All Squared, which is focused on employing people who are coming back to our community from incarceration. Dr. Happy Reynolds, who has uh, was actually, I think, the only person who was a previous member of the Youth Violence Prevention Steering Committee, is coming back to work with us, and she is a pediatrician and also the Ward 6 appointee. Madison Stallman, who's the Ward 3 appointee, is also the founding president of Helping Hands, which is a local nonprofit working on violence prevention. John Turnipseed, who's doing some work with our city attorney's office through Urban Ventures, Jen White from our mayor's office who is leading the work there on public safety, and then lastly, Shane Zahn from our downtown improvement district. So we do have six voting member seats that are still available and we are working um, strategically and have a consultant, Lynn Brittle, who is helping us to put those applications in place and making sure we're getting a good slew of diversity to fill the remaining slots. I wanted to ask quickly, um, for Kim Caprini, is she the Ward 4 appointee, or is she represented, because she's not representing the schools? No, she is technically representing oh, the so schools. She, she just wants to be clear that she can't speak on behalf of Minneapolis Public got Schools. Got it. Okay. Just wanted to double check to see which, if she was, so is the Ward 4 seat still open then? Yes, sir. All right. Ward well, we will is, remedy that. Yes. Thank you, Thank you sir. <laughs> um, it should also be noted that our first meeting is this month on June 27th. We're excited to bring folks together, start to get to know each other, and lay out some strategies about what we'll be working on in 2019 and 2020. With that, we'll roll into some conversation about the Violence Prevention Fund. In the 2019 budget, um, the Violence Prevention Fund was established, and it was really designed to um, help us think about community-led strategies and make sure that we were supporting, with, with real dollars, ways to get money into the community, both in downtown and in a citywide fashion. Um, in the actual language that was created here in Council, $150,000 were to be set aside for downtown strategies, and we used the balance of those remaining funds to develop an RFP process for the remainder of the city, which left us with about $200,000 to do citywide implementation. So we felt like it was really important in this work to get community feedback, and we knew that we had a very short period of time to try to get some insights. And with that information, we decided to do an online survey. We were very fortunate in the health department to have a very skilled and talented research and evaluation team. And they were able to help us design a quick online survey that we could put out via social media and via email to get some responses back from community about what they thought were the priority areas that we should be funding in for violence prevention strategies. We got 364 completed surveys over two weeks, um, which from our research team, the feedback we got was that that is really good given the time. Um, we'd love to do the same or something similar again and have it out for a longer period of time, but we did not want to go into the process without getting some insight from community residents. I have a question from Council Vice President, or comment from Council Vice President Jenkins. Thank you, Chair Cunningham. Um, Ms. Cunningham, can you just explain what the urgency, I mean, what's driving the time? <laughs> yes. Lines? So the budget was approved obviously in December, and most violence prevention work happens over the summer months, just given the nature of um, public safety and the concerns that people have, a lot of the project work happens over summer. And des designing and developing an RFA or an RFP takes some time, and getting that approved takes time. And so in order to get the money out, what we heard from community members and the kinds of agencies that were intending to apply for this money was that they would want to be able to do the work starting as early as May. So we wanted to get the RFPs and applications out in spring so that we could start funding these programs as early as possible. So it did add a sense of urgency for us that the community, and j just generally in the way that the work has been done and basing it on sort of the collaborative public safety strategies that had happened over the last two years, we wanted to make sure that funds were available during the summer. Okay, follow up. Thank you. Um, is there any suggestions of how we can, because I'm just not sure everybody is being able to be aware of these opportunities if it's 
this really tight timeline and you know seemingly there's few people who are a few groups who are engaged in this and and so certainly they're aware but you know i mean with something like biennial budgeting process help with this uh to increase opportunities for more community members to be engaged in this conversation? Absolutely. So both biannual funding and the fact that the funding that we have, at least part of it um, being ongoing, is really important to the stability of the funding. Our hope is that for the 2020 round of funding that we know we'll have, we want to get those RFPs out as early as late December, early January, so that agencies can start applying right away, have the money in queue to be able to start hiring or figuring out contractual responsibilities as early in the year as possible. But that is every year dependent on the budget cycle and what we know we'll have to work with in the RFA and RFP process. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's one of the benefits of having the ongoing dollars is it makes it more predictable for us to be able to get further ahead in the process moving forward. So that is very exciting. Back to you. Yes, and so in the survey, the findings um, did show that youth violence and peer violence were the top priorities of the community members that we were able to hear from. Um, we had a variety of, of choices for folks to choose from as far as what they thought they could prioritize, but what really rose to the surface was youth and peer violence. Um, the surveys reinforced the need to prioritize a diverse and varied approach, though, because what we also saw was that the way they wanted that work to be delivered was really broad and wide. So we tried to keep the RFP consistent with these kinds of forms of violence or forms of, of treatment or intervention, I guess I should say, in order for a wide range of stakeholders to be able to apply and do project-related work. So there were $150,000 made available for downtown projects um, through the request. We allowed agencies to apply for up to $50,000, and um, the existing activities, expansion activities and new activities were able to be considered. So we didn't want to limit people to just new work because we know that sometimes with a short period of time, you know, less than one year to work on the project, it may be best for them to be able to either enhance existing work or fund something that they know is already working. Um, projects could focus on prevention in one or more forms, and applicants were encouraged to propose activities that reflected their own expertise and experiences. We received 15 applications with a total worth a total of almost $700,000, even though we only had $150,000 to put out. And so we know that there's a great need, um, and this is just the downtown RFA. We had 12 external reviewers that included people from in, inside the city enterprise but outside of health as well as people from the AmeriCorps VISTA program, from Moms Demand Action for Change, and from Minneapolis Public Schools. Um, based on those proposals, we were able to fund five agencies with the caveat that one of the, the actual funding sources for a mother's love is coming from the Minneapolis Police Department through an existing opportunity that they had. We're funding Mad Dads out of the Health Department's funds, St. Stephen's, Green Minneapolis, and the Hennepin Theater Trust. So Mad Dads will provide their own unique version of outreach that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, with street patrols and community members out in the downtown community at late night club let hour hours. Um, they also have a great way of networking with people and helping direct them to services. St. Stephen's will continue to do outreach um, with highly mobile and homeless young people ages 18 to 24 in the downtown community. Um, I don't want to read the whole thing, but. And then um, Green Minneapolis is doing something that we think is really innovative and in trying to um, find ways for young people to have input in what happens at the commons. We know that downtown is a hub for young people to come to, and we want to make sure that they have safe activities to engage in. And so they'll be working in partnership with YCB to both collect information about what young people want to do when they're downtown and then implement those strategies. And then the Hennepin Theater Trust is going to be using art installations music and spoken word events to really um, liven up the Hennepin Theater District, um, both inside and outside. And that will be from um, as early as June, as soon as we can get those contracts in place through the end of the year. So they'll be doing outdoor things during the summer months and then moving inside once it gets cold. 
Our citywide violence prevention fund, um, we had roughly $200,000 to be able to allocate resources. Agencies were able to apply for funds of up to $50,000 that could go through the end of the year, although many of them are focused on summer. Um, again, we encourage them to use existing activities, expansion of activities, and new activities. And then projects could be focused on prevention or more forms of violence, or one, or more than, one or more forms of violence, excuse me. We received 19 applications, totaling a request of, again, around $700,000. So each of these application processes got applications of looking at funds of up to $700,000, while we only had 150 for downtown and 200 for the citywide, which to us really shows a, a need for this kind of funding. We had 11 external reviewers, and the proposals um, based on the review process that we are looking to move forward would be the Lake Street Council, Minnesota Peace Builders Leadership Institute, Banyan Community, Juxtaposition Arts, Art is My Weapon, and the Camden Promise, and lastly, East Phillips Improvement Coalition. So the Lake Council, uh, Lake Street Council is looking to address violence prevention through um, building coalition amongst business owners and trying to um, host workshops for employees and local businesses and organizations um, to address violence in the workplace, which we know can be so important, particularly in storefront businesses. And they're also looking to engage midtown small business owners to activate members in a safety coalition. Um, Minnesota Peace Building Leadership Institute is addressing psychological trauma and doing training um, through the Starlight Training Model. We are really excited about this opportunity because we know so often the folks who are doing this work, um, thinking about some of our own programs like Next Step and GVI, are not always getting the trauma-informed care models that they need. So we're really looking forward to being able to encourage folks from our own you know, contractual organizations to participate in this kind of training because we know it will improve the quality of their service delivery and the quality of how they take care of themselves. The Banyan Community um, Organization on the South Side is doing work right now. Um, to impact neighborhood and community safety in East Phillips. And they're really looking at uniting block clubs and doing some work around um, breakfasts with officers and trying to get community members and officers to develop better relationships. And juxtaposition with their infamous work around arts are also looking to do art installations in Jordan, Hawthorne, and the Fowell neighborhoods. They'll be doing activities around art and um, self-healing along the Broadway corridor. And then Art is My Weapon, um, has an exciting installation that they're looking at doing across the city. Um, they've done some work like this in the past around decommissioning guns and using the metal to create art. The art that they're proposing in this project would be five benches, two of which would be in north, two of which would be in south, and one downtown. That could be art installations on display permanently or semi-permanently across the city focused on violence prevention. We're very excited about this project and the longevity that it has and the use that it has of art and bringing young people together to create this kind of art um, that's really focused on taking something that can be ugly, like guns, and making it something beautiful. And the Camden Promise, last but not least, is looking to do community work up in the Camden neighborhood. And they will be doing food distribution, as well as some employment readiness, and then also some peace marches throughout the community. Um, we think that this will be particularly interesting because the employment work that they want to do is with group and gang members, and so we see some clear ties into the work that the city has already prioritized with the Camden Promise. Oh, not last but not least, the East Phillips Improvement Coalition is addressing multiple forms of violence and using youth leadership as their forum. The projects will include equipping young people with canvassing skills and allowing them to go out and survey community members about how they think violence prevention should be addressed in community. So some of the lessons that we've learned in this process. Our RFA process allowed agencies to apply directly to the health department's email address, which we found to be relatively seamless for small community-led agencies. Our e-supplier system, which is the system that had to be used for procurement through the RFP process, was much more cumbersome. We received several emails and complaints from agencies who tried to get into the system and were unable to apply because there were barriers with the e-supplier system. So we wanna make sure that we figure out a way if we want to focus on community-led initiatives, that we're making sure that community-based agencies, particularly small ones that maybe don't have someone that's tech-savvy, really have a way to apply that is making it easy and seamless for them. 
Um, community interest in funding is significantly greater than the funds that we have available. So as you can see from the presentation, we had lots of applications that unfortunately we were unable to fund just to a fund limitation. Many of the applications we got were worthy of funding. We just really had to be diligent about thinking about what we could do with the resources that we had and how to make the most of the money we had to work with. But clearly there's an interest and ability from agencies to do more work than what we're able to fund here at the city. The application process and project timing, again, to Councilmember Jenkins' point, was tight this year with it being the first year and us wanting to get those funds out the door as quickly as possible. We are being very thoughtful about the 2020 process and trying to figure out how we can get those RFPs out sooner so that there is not such a rush to get them back in the door so that people have a longer span of time to do the application process. And then engagement through community input survey. We really saw that in a short period of time, we got a lot of response from community. Our research team was not expecting to get over 300 people to respond in a two week period to an online survey. So we'd like to do more engagement like that to get input from community both online and in person to make sure that we're hearing from the constituency about what kind of violence prevention strategies they want to see the office working on. I have a question or comment from Council Member Cano. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, I appreciate staff giving an update on this. Um, I, I wanted to start by saying that, uh, you know, probably a third of my office's work uh, focuses on crime and safety and livability issues. Um, the Ninth Ward is inside the Third Precinct, which the Third Precinct is the largest geographic precinct in the entire city. It also carries the highest concentration of opioid, opioid overdoses as well as prostitution. Um, and uh, a lot of the questions that I get are around where are the street outreach workers, where are is the um, where are the shelters where people can go and and stay uh, so they're not um, sleeping on the street or sleeping on the um, on the entrances to the businesses? Where is the help for the um, chronic drug abuse that we see happening in our neighborhoods and um, and the drug addiction that we see, especially with heroin and fentanyl and some of these other things that are hitting our community pretty hard and, and disproportionately so. Of course, communities of color and low-income communities are getting hit the hardest. Um, so, um, I'm, you know, I'm hearing a lot of, of that, you know, where is the street outreach, where are the folks who are out on the, in the neighborhoods making connections with folks who are struggling, and, and that's coupled with another request to not send so many police out into making these contacts, but to invest in nonprofit social service agencies that can help address um, a lot of these challenges, which I think you know two thirds of it seems to be coming from from drugs and, and addiction to drugs. Um, so one of the questions that's been recently coming to me more and more fre frequently is how are we um, making sure that these resources that we are investing in nonprofit partners to help us address crime and safety and livability issues? Um, you know the, the questions are around. Can we see the contracts? Can we see the specifics? Can we see how many times they're gonna be out there? Because people aren't feeling the impact. And so my question is more around um, how are we as a city, how do we develop a process of accountability where we are investing in um, community safety beyond policing strategies that we can stand behind and show results and say, yes, we invested $239,000 you know, for work that's going to happen in 20, 2019. And at the end of 2019, we can say, and we did this and this and this. And so um, you know, I've, I've been trying to get the contracts that uh, the city attorney's office has enacted with Minnesota Indian Women's Resource Center and Pride and the Family Partnership, because I don't fully quite understand sort of how we uh, detail the, the results that we're trying to get out of these contracts. And, um, and I know it's hard for, for foundations as well to, to get contracts out and, and, and communicate results. And, and we as at the city are sort of acting as a foundation in, in a way when we're, when we're issuing out these resources. And I know it's been extremely hard to um, grapple with the tight timeline that we have, which sometimes feels even unfair for a community, where they're asked to come up with a new idea within three months and then submit it to the city, and then the city's supposed to somehow get the money out within one month, and then within the next two months, 
before summer's over, we're supposed to, um, you know, see these results. So I feel like we're like trying to help each other, but we're also getting in the way of one another, and at the same time, we're kind of losing. Um, like the, the 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 results component to this, so so I sh I share this to to say really I'm I'm struggling to share the the impact of these resources with my community. I'm struggling to document what work is being done and how frequently and how effective, and I'm interested in in seeing our resources be less diffuse and more focused on the tightly run programs and initiatives such as the GVI program and others that the city has and that we've ran and that can show results and improvements. And so I'm just wondering, um, now that these resources are going to be kind of, you know, sent out into the community, what is the process or the mechanism or the systems that we might have in place as policymakers and staff to be able to say, hey, you know, at the end of 2019, this is what we were able to get done, this is how much work we accomplished, this is our impact. Or are we just kind of experimenting and just kind of sharing money out there each year, hoping that something sticks to the wall and that at some level we're able to communicate that? Because I'm not sure what to communicate to folks about impact and results. If I might, um, uh, Gretchen Musicant, Commissioner of Health, um, Mr. Chair and Council Member Cano, I had at least three thoughts, and hopefully I can remember all of them in, in answer to uh, your comments. Um, one is that uh, the role of the Office of Violence Prevention now is to not only do its own work, but to connect with other work across the enterprise. And we're really just starting that because we we're not fully staffed yet, but that is something high on our minds. And so um, some of the needs that you talked about in your community really are also being looked at through the lens of um, opioids. And um, we heard from the Mayor's Multi-Jurisdictional Task Force on Opioids that there was a lot of interest in replicating something we'd done in violence prevention, the Next Step program, and thinking about how do we connect with people not only in addition to connecting with them in the hospital if they might overdose, but also in the community as we see people who are in danger of overdosing or overdosing, and how do we create community touch points for folks? And so we are pursuing grants um, along those lines, and we know of other communities that have done that work. And so uh, part of the work of the Office of Violence Prevention will be to weave back together some of these things that are occurring not only in the, in the Office of Violence Prevention. Another um, thought that occurred to me uh, in response to your question is the um, SREAP process. And I always forget what those letters stand for. I know what they stand for, but I can't remember the, what, the, what each letter is. But um, strategic, thank you very much. So we are in the process of working with the team to identify that priority that, that you established, one of the three priorities, had to do with, with violence. And so um, we are looking for what is the focus of the city going to be within that construct and definitely looking at what measures can we have so we can say yes or no, we're making progress or we're not making progress or these component parts. I don't think it'll fully answer your question, but it is starting to get tighter on that. And then the fourth piece would be we certainly, as part of any grants that we put out in the community, collect information about what was done with that money. And so we can definitely report on that, but I don't think that gives you the same aggregate answer that maybe you were looking for, but we can definitely provide you the very specifics of what occurred within certain grants. So those are my four thoughts. And I appreciate the, the three things you shared at the beginning. I'm, I'm very interested in that fourth piece because mm -hmm. folks do really want to know, okay, so did we give an organization $10,000 to just sit in the office and answer phones, or are we giving them $10,000 to like hit the streets twice a week and make some contacts and log who those contacts were? And so they're, they're sort of asking for that, that accountability piece, and I need to just be able to communicate that better. Um, so would love any help and support and making sure that that's really clear and, and that the expectations are set so that it's not just like, well, here's $10,000, good luck, and we'll touch base with you in December to see what happened. Mm -hmm. But I'm kind of getting into that realm of the work right now is just asking those questions. So I appreciate that yeah. fourth point. Yeah. 
I, um, I'm actually curious as to whether or not there has been specific metrics defined um, in terms of for the data gathering piece. I think adding to what Councilmember Kano was asking is maybe if, if there's some metrics that are specifically being measured that folks have to report back with. So we have not established the contracts yet because they have to be fully approved, but we are happy to work with our evaluation team to establish some metrics um, and I'm happy to take feedback from you all if there are metrics that you'd like us to keep in mind to do both pre and post with the agencies that have been selected for funding. I think that could be a really great opportunity to plug in. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Back to you. Yes, so that concludes our portion of the presentation. At this time, we'd like to pass it over to our partners from Cities United, which is a national technical assistance agency that Minneapolis is a part of, so that they can provide information on the recommendations they have for the development of our Office of Violence Prevention. They've been working us, with us on this over the last several months. So with that, I will bring up Mr. Anthony uh, Smith. I almost said Taylor. Sorry. You're going to forget Smith? <laughs> well, so good afternoon. Smith. Thank you, guys. Uh, thank you, Chair and uh, Council and the members. I also want to thank Gretchen, uh, Sasha, and Josh for their support in building out this work. But I really want to just thank you all for your leadership and thought, this forward thinking in that last uh, conversation that we just had about how we measure the work. I think it's super important uh, to making sure that we get the work right. So again, Anthony Smith. I serve as the executive director for Cities United. We are a national organization working with cities all across the country, really helping cities think about long-term strategies around how we create safe, healthy, and hopeful communities, right? I know we're talking about violence prevention, but I don't think that's what we're really trying to do. What we're really trying to do is make sure kids have the opportunities to live safe, healthy, and hopeful lives, right? And that means bigger than just staying away from violence. That means they have perfect, I mean, opportunities to have uh, powerful educations, safe housing, uh, but also that their families have access to opportunities around jobs and careers. So what does that look like as a city and how do we do that collectively? And part of our job is really helping folks think through that process and what that looks like. Uh, so as we move forward, we came in town a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago, and spent a lot of time in community and with most of you all, we had meetings as well, and really just talked through what is everybody's vision for this office that we're putting together and what does that look like and feel like. And a lot of what we heard, and as you all also heard, based on who applied for the grants, it was again around how do we give kids access to things that are safe, healthy, and hopeful. So when we talk about what recommendations look like and how we move the work forward, we really want you all to move away from violence prevention and more so around what your vision is for your community. And the vision that I hear you all is talking about is really trying to figure out how do we create safe, healthy, and hopeful communities. So how do we change the name of the office and move it from violence prevention to more around the office for safe communities, healthy communities, or hopeful communities, and really push ourselves to think more about what our vision is for our, for our kids and for our city, and not the issue that we're trying to deal with, right? Because we all know that that comes up and it's something that we got to deal with. So that's a vision for us, looking at how do we focus on the vision, and how do we think more about an asset framing and not a deficit framing, but how do we make an asset framing approach to this work as well? Uh, second uh, for us is also Minneapolis has been like a go-to city for years with your blueprint that you guys have been uh, working on and using, uh, but it hasn't been updated since 2013. Uh, so we think it's time to really update that and use that as your guide and your template for the office. So really taking, taking time to work with community to really update and really up, uh, refresh the blueprint on how we move forward. Uh, we see that as a way to really get community buy-in and then also get community accountability and shared accountability and a shared vision. Uh, so if you all, if we really take some time to put community members in and create this new blueprint together, where it is not just uh, what is the city gonna do, but what are we as a community gonna do and who's, uh, who's responsible for which goals and outcomes in that plan is gonna be important. Uh, one of the things that we saw when we were here is that we did not see uh, a lot of youth input and youth voice inside of the, inside of the work. So we're, we're recommending that you all create a youth council or a youth team that really gets to be a part of the leadership, not just that we bring young people together and use them for photo ops and use them for, uh, to do rubber stamping, but that they really help lead the work. Uh, part of that recommendation is from this youth council is that two of them actually sits on the steering committee so that they toggle back and forth between the bigger table, but then also with their peers. Uh, we usually want this, our group uh, that we usually ask folks to do is look at young people between ages of 14 and 24 and put them through an re application process and really uh, get them on a team. But also once we get them on a team, make sure that they get uh, uh, 
reimbursed or, or repaid for their time. So make sure that there's a stipend and that there's money set aside to take care of these young people so that they're, uh, they are actually being rewarded for their time that they're giving back to the city for. Uh, but then it also helps us think about not just that they can help plan and develop and coordinate activities, but we create this real opportunity for a youth adult partnership where young people and adults are working in partnership together. But then also for us, we think about who's next. And when you bring young people to the table early, they start seeing themselves in roles where they can be on the council, where they can be the next Gretchen, Josh, or Sasha as well. Because a lot of times the young people from the communities that we're talking about don't know what all you can do inside of city government and nobody's intentionally looking for them. But this way you create a pipeline of young people who are prepared and ready to be a part of that conversation. I think it's also important that we think about as we build out this office, uh, what's a policy scan look like? How do we look at current policies and see if some of those policies are hindering our work or if they're supporting our work. Because if they're hindering our work, we got to make sure we can make some changes uh, around that stuff. So I think it having a real good policy scan is going to be important to what the work looks like. And then from there, how do, we do, how do we develop a new policy agenda that helps us move forward? And when we think about policy, that includes budget. And we'll get to budget a little bit later because I think we got to talk about a clear stream. Uh, to also, uh, council member, I, I, Kano, uh, Kano, uh, I think this idea of hosting quarterly public meetings is important because that's about transparency and you do that in community. You don't have folks come to council or come into city government. You do that in the neighborhoods where we are actually doing the work in and people are experiencing violence. But I think those quarterly meetings are important to update people on where we are, get more community buy-in, but then also it's about how do we hold ourselves accountable to the community that we say we're serving. Uh, but then also for us, it's important that we're doing all of this great work. We're, we're putting all this stuff out. We got to have a clear communication strategy. How do we talk to the community and others around one, what we're doing, but then two, how do you be a part of the work, right? Because you guys want to make sure that your philanthropy community, your business community, your faith community, and other communities know that they're a part of this work and this is how you can be a part of it. But I think that communication strategy has got to be uh, one that we do well. And we're saying leverage the city's communications team to really create a marketing and communication strategy. So some of this is around how do you brand the work? So we're going to put a new blueprint out, a new office. How do you brand that so that when people hear about it and see it, they know exactly what they're doing and how they can fit into the work. So we're asking for that to take place. And that includes thinking about what our social media and media relationships and how we've been more uh, out in front of this issue and how do we all have the same talking points when we talk about it from the city. So when we talk about creating talking points, we would love for each of you offices to have the same talking points so that we're all on the same page and that we're all moving from the same sheet of music. Uh, I think the last recommendation that we really want to make sure that we talk about, and I heard you all talk about the funding, is it's got to have a dedicated funding stream for this work in this office so that we can make sure that the work gets moved along the way so that they don't have to be thinking about what we got to cut every year or what do we add every year. Uh, I was looking at the 2019 budget, and it looks like the health department only gets 1% of the overall $1.7 billion. And when you look at that compared to what the police department get, which is 11%, that doesn't mean that that doesn't seem that we're moving in a different direction. So how do you all start looking at the budget yearly and saying, where else can we cut to then add to this body of work? Because this body of work is the prevention and intervention work that we want to see done. And part of what we're always asking cities to do is think about <clears throat> how do you reimagine what public safety means to the community? And then how do you redefine that? And then how do you reallocate your budget to show that's where you're moving to? So we really think that as you move forward, once the plan is developed, we've got a clear strategy of how we want to move forward. Then we got to figure out how we fund that. And it's got to start at the city, but I think it also gives you all this clear plan, gives you an opportunity to talk to your stakeholders from your foundations and your corporations who would come in and support once they knew what the city scan in the game was. So with that, any questions? Great, thank you. Um, I think there's actually quite a bit of work for us to be able to dig into with yep. those recommendations. And um, I, I really love the name, Office of Safe Communities. Um, 
I think I'm only apprehensive because I think I'm slightly becoming infamous for changing names of things at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Changed the name of the Upper Harbor Terminal Community group a couple times. But um, but I really love that assets-based focus, really shifting that paradigm away from what are we trying, the problem we're trying to address to the outcome we're right. trying to get. So I really, really appreciate that. Um, I have a question or comment from Councilmember Gordon. I also really appreciate the recommendations, and one of my thoughts is this could be some work that actually could be vetted and, and um, looked at by the new leadership group that's coming forward, uh, and the, we should definitely carry those ideas forward, and, and uh, I like the idea a little bit if the name is going to change, it should be part of the refreshed yeah. plan, and maybe that's something we could ease into so that we don't change the name too quickly or whatever but still it could be part of it maybe blueprints old and roadmaps better now i don't know but um i think that that's a big piece of work uh and we better have the buy-in from the staff and the leadership team to do that uh, and i think that we probably do yeah. um, and i don't know that we necessarily need a staff direction on those things i'm sure that staff's going to be review reviewing the recommendations and seeing about when and how and what and if we can do it i also would call out that we do have a youth congress and the youth coordinating board and it might be really nice to coordinate with them because the idea of a youth council is very exciting and then two members who could serve and i think having some kind of stipend for them would be important i also like that because it's actually preserving and holding on to the importance of youth violence prevention which started all of this right. and i don't think we want to lose that and that could be really key um, to doing that so um makes me more excited about it seeing those recommendations and appreciate hearing them and gives us some stuff to think on and work on in the weeks ahead thank you thank you so much for all of your work on this thank and for you. for coming to town and and really digging into the the issues the possibilities the work that's already happening and what is what can happen in the future so thank you so much and these are really powerful recommendations that we're going to be able to dig more into with our team of folks um i also want to say thank you to commissioner musicant to sasha to josh for all of your work as well with establishing the office of violence prevention um also with allocating the funds um one of the things is that um, as we as policy makers are thinking about this public health approach to public safety the paradigm shift away from strictly enforcement to also including prevention and intervention um, that we think about how do we properly and adequately source this work. We need to make sure, you know, it was exciting that we were able to have the public safety um, omnibus amendment last year's in last year's budget that created this uh, violence prevention fund, but with limited resources means that we have to focus very narrowly geographically. Um, I'm excited because in North Minneapolis, we do have a lot of challenges and this is investing in addressing some of those challenges, but um, but the demand is throughout the entire city. Um, and every, every person who is impacted by gun violence or violence of any kind, every life that is lost, whether that's in wards three, four, five, six, or nine, um, or in one or eight, in any of the wards um, is unacceptable. So being able to really scale the work adequately and be able to meet the demands that are there, um, I think is really important for us to take into consideration and really work um, across this legislative body as well as with the mayor's office to make sure that we are actively operationalizing the public health approach to public safety in a real way uh, because we are seeing improvements. Um, the the data that you know i get to see is around we all see around violent crime i can say that since we've been implementing gvi at next step and the various um, interventions that we've been working on we've seen a notable decrease and still everything is every single incident is unacceptable but a decrease is pretty great too and so i want to make sure that we acknowledge that um and so how do we fold this in and make it a priority alongside enforcement um, without negating the need for it? Uh, it doesn't have to be either or. I think a lot of times the conversation really becomes either or. Either we're for prevention and intervention or we're for enforcement. And what we have to do is think about it in as a, as a continuum of work that has to be done with public safety. Councilmember Cano. 
I appreciate your points, Mr. Chair. And as you were talking, it, it reminded me that um, oftentimes when we're talking about these issues of um, reducing gun violence and addressing youth um, youth violence and some of the um, um, challenges we have with commercial sexual exploitation and the uh, opioid abuse, uh, I think people lean on the city a lot because they know us. We're so hyper-local. We show up at the picnics and at the festivals and at the vigils and at the baby showers. And so people have our cell phone numbers and they call upon us and we're, we're in the community a lot. But I would say that it would be great if we could use this opportunity with the conversation that we've just started with Sasha and our guest speaker to really invite the county and the state and the parks to be a part, an active partner in that and a funder of that work because we're like, you know, David versus Goliath and we're like, you know, with our little slingshot throwing, you know, these rocks at these mammoth problems. And I don't feel the presence of the other jurisdictions that are at the table. Um, so if you do have thoughts about that, I would welcome them because it seems like um, sometimes I just feel like I'm drowning in the, in the problem and I'm not really seeing other leaders kind of help. Brooklyn Center. So I think this kind of regional approach would be smart on you all's part, but I also think there's a number of states who have now, cities and advocates have advocated states to then set aside money strictly for this issue, right? So you got California who's putting aside, I think, 27 million this year, and they're dictating it to certain states. So I think there's some advocacy we could do at the state level where I can share those bills and we can think about what that looks like, especially if we do that and the regional approach with other cities uh, and jurisdictions here who really want to look for that work. So I think you're right on point with that. And I think the way we want to do the work, you know, it's, it happens at the local level, but because of where you all sit, you got young people going back and forth to all of these different places, and it would only make sense for you all to have a regional approach, but then also advocate to the state to really support the work in a way that we know other states are doing as well. So you got a blueprint that we could just use and move forward on. So I just think that that would be my recommendation and solution because of the way you all said you're close to so many folks uh, who are already thinking about, thinking about the work. And I think uh, Mayor Lundy uh, in Brooklyn Park actually just hosted a regional convening where he invited other mayors and other law enforcement to come and have this conversation with him. And I think it would just be, a, you guys got an easy kind of platform to start that. But then I think the state work could be pretty powerful as well. Okay. Of course, I, I just think that it's noteworthy that we, um, that the city did not solely create the conditions that have created the violence that we see in the community and we alone cannot solve it. We have to be working with our, our jurisdictional partners and, and our surrounding communities as well. Council Vice President Jenkins. Thank you, Chair Cunningham. Um, I, I just wanted, um, I guess echo uh, a lot of the comments that uh, yourself and Councilman McConnell have shared. You know, we really need to be thinking about how uh, the role of opioids and other drugs play in violence, um, in violence, I guess, prevention, but uh, certainly the role that it it plays in creating violence, um, as well as, you know, you, you mentioned that we really, this is a citywide issue, um, and, you know, while a number of the resources, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure that um, the decisions that were made about where the funding goes is data-driven, though it, was a very short timeline, and so it's hard to get, you know, all the data, all the input, all the applications from people who are really um, in need of those services in in time, in a timely way. But these issues are, I mean, we are experiencing some really significant challenges with um, drug addiction in the past two weeks. You know, um, there have been over 60 plus deaths from uh, overdoses, and 33 of them are were in the third precinct on Lake Street in the East Phillips neighborhood. And so, you know, 
if we're doing data-driven approaches, this is where these challenges are happening and, and we need to be investing in those. So I just want to um, highlight your comments as well as um, Councilmember Connell's and that it, it has to be um, this broad strategy and approach to thinking about violence um, beyond you know, the really pernicious and um, tragic violence that happens in our youth communities, it's, it's broader and we, we have to address that as well. Certainly with our partners in other jurisdictions, um, you know, gun control is an issue that the state can take action on and they're not. Um, Hennepin County is certainly plays a major role in how we deal with young people in our communities. And so they need to be coming to the table with, with resources and brain power as well. And just one of the things, council member, is that when you think about, I mean, because I think all of those are, to your point, need to be addressed. So I think as we think about what that looks like, there's a number of cities who have made their safety work or safe, healthy work around homicide reduction, suicide reduction, and overdose reduction. Uh, you gotta have a, you, the team has gotta have enough space to think about all of those, because all of those take different strategies, and I think they're all important work, right? So one of the things, especially, so I can talk about when I did it in Louisville, when I ran it for Mayor Fisher, those were the three things that they asked me to pay attention to. We ended up creating work groups for all three, and then the other two became their own separate thing, because the homicide and shootings was enough for one office to work on. Uh, but we ended up creating other, inside of the health department, uh, other kind of teams that then took over that work. Uh, but again, a big piece of it is how do you bring community who's already doing a lot of that and help them develop different kind of strategies and connect tighter to the city. So I think one of the things we could all do is a, do a quick scan of who's doing that work in the community and then try to figure out how do we help them get what the resources they need, but then also what kind of city help we can do. I just uh, kind of caution putting it all on one office, but I think that office can serve as the backbone and kind of like the, kind of do the scans for you all and help you see who's out there uh, and then figure out how do we create subgroups or work groups that can then move that work forward. Because I think it's right, if you really are saying we want help safe, healthy, and hopeful communities, then we've got to figure out how do we do that and how do we keep all of our folks uh, safe, healthy, and hopeful all at the same time. I also just want to add, um, thank you, uh, Council Vice President Jenkins. Um, I also just want to add one of the things I appreciate about the about this office is that while we talk a lot about youth violence prevention, it also covers domestic violence, it, uh, intimate, intimate partner violence. It also talks about early uh, childhood exposure to violence um, and other areas of intervention that are available. Um, I do have one question, and I think it would just be helpful to clarify. Um, where does the opioid work that currently exists or is in development, how does that fit into slash is separate from, I'm not sure if this is for Sasha or for Commissioner Musicant, um, but how do we, f where does the opioid work fit in, just for clarification, because there were discussions about does should this fall within the Office of Violence Prevention, should it not? So what's happening currently and how is it in relationship to this office? Thank you, um, Councilmember Cunningham. We um, have just one-time funding of a very small amount for addressing opioids. Um, we are trying to make of that something that has some staying power because it is a a huge challenge in our community. We are being guided by the multi-jurisdictional task force that the mayor put together and the recommendations there. Um, but this one-time funding of 50,000 is what we're working with and so we're trying to fundraise and, and, and make something a little bit more permanent. Um, as Mr. Smith mentioned, it's, it's a large body of work. Uh, right now, we don't have it housed in the Office of Violence Prevention, um, but we are, as a department, continuing to, to work on it and to kind of bring life to uh, something that the community is both struggling with and very interested and excited about addressing. And so, um, 
yeah, it's uh, to be determined, but at this point it's not part of the office, and I guess I wouldn't put it there right away um, as long as we have other activities that we're able to do within the health department and we're able to, to coordinate because I think the office itself needs to get its feet on the ground and write another blueprint and you know look across the enterprise and so on. So we won't keep them uh, separate from each other, but I don't think we'll integrate it right away. Thank you for that. Are there any other questions or comments from my colleagues? Yes, yeah, so there was $50,000 that were allocated one time to the health department through the 2019 budget. Yep. And they've done a great job. They actually have two Minnesota opioid, cri I'm trying to remember what they're, what, what's, what is it? The recovery core. So they actually have two vistas. I think is what the program is that's focusing on it. Would you speak a little bit to that? Because I just want to really highlight because this is a very like in your face issue right now in certain parts of the city. And so I just want to make sure that we're integrating that into this part of the conversations. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. We were able to secure um, two. Vista, vistas which are in this uh, focused only on opioids and system related approaches to opioids um, and they will be finishing their year i believe at the end of summer and we have already um, been able to get an agreement that we will have two more um, at the end of, of their term and so we do have have that extra person power um, but we also um, need some resources for them to work with just also want to vouch a little bit for them that they work really hard. Um, I have uh, at agenda setting, they've come several times and presented on their various work. So it's not just, a, oh, we have some VISTAs who are doing a few things here and there. They're actually digging into the work. So all right, thank you so much for that. And thank you, team, for all of your hard work. You were given a big challenge with a short period of time and you truly have have done amazing work in that period of time so we have two uh actions that we need to take as a as a committee right now so the first is uh i move approval of receiving and filing the presentation on the establishment of the office of violence prevention all those in favor please signify by saying aye aye, aye. those opposed say nay the ayes have it the last item that we have is authorizing contracts with the lake street council minnesota peace building leadership institute the banyan community juxtaposition arts art is my weapon the camden promise and the east phillips improvement coalition for an amount not to exceed a total of $239,250 for specifically designated strategies for citywide violence prevention outside of downtown. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The ayes have it, and those items are approved. Thank you so much, everybody, for all of your hard work. This is one of my the kind of uh, committee meetings that I really love because it gets to highlight the diverse, amazing work that's reported to this committee. So, and all of the hardworking, passionate city staff and also partners like Cities United who come together to truly make amazing work happen in our city. So thank you everybody so much. And with that, we are adjourned.